This episode is brought to you by La Quinta by Wyndham. Here you are, miles from home and ready to start your vacation. Good thing you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. They have free high-speed Wi-Fi to stream all your favorite movies. And in the morning, get fresh waffles with their free bright side breakfast. Or squeeze in a workout at their fitness center. Either way, you're ready to conquer the day. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you triumph. Book your stay at LQ.com. This episode is brought to you by HP. When you're working apart from your team, feeling connected can be a challenge. Presenting HP Presence, a more thoughtful, human collaboration technology. With enhanced audio and video features, you can experience more genuine collaboration and feel more connected. Be in the room, from any room, with HP Presence. Learn more at hp.com forward slash presence. Hello, everyone. Ray here. Uh, So for this episode, I need to change things up a bit because I have a special announcement to make at the end. So what I'll do is um, introduce all my newest members and and, uh, some other suggestions I have to make. Then we'll do the episode and then my special announcement uh, at the end. I think you'll be very excited about it. So I'd like to say hello to my newest members, Kenneth C. from Bracknell, UK, Jack S., Mark L. from Nottingham, UK, Zach W. from Denton, Texas, Matt S. from Middlesex, UK, Lloyd A. from Oregon City, Oregon, and then Jim E. from Portland, Oregon, and um, Paul T. from Kent in the UK, and then there's Gerald K. from Victoria, Australia. So hello to my new members. Thank you very much for supporting the podcast. I really do appreciate it. And in the last couple of episodes, I made references to Oldham, um, where Winston has gone for different reasons. But it's in, it's in Lincolnshire, not Lincolnshire. So I apologize for that mistake. I did not mean to offend anybody. And thank you to Gareth C. for pointing that out to me. I think he said he was born there. And lastly, I would like to thank Timothy K. from Pauling, New York, who's ordered some CDs for his father for Christmas. So thank you to everyone. I really do appreciate all the support. And um, let's get on with the show. Hello, and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 94, In for a Penny. For all of Winston's excitement, in an unclimactic way, the British were not prepared for war. Besides Churchill's exertions, the country had no set plan with goals, timelines, a system for conscription, military objectives, and now that they decided to help the French, no real plan for getting the men across the channel. And, at the time, Britain was spending less money on the army than they did in 1901. All this has to be compared to the detailed, intricate Schlieflin plan of Germany that played such a large role in propelling that country into war. No, all Britain had was the War Book of 1911 that was drawn up with resistance by the order of Haldane. Still, it was completely inadequate for what London needed now. And in this current climate of uncertainty, for the leaders as well as the people, madcap rumors flourished everywhere. For example, not true were the 70,000 Russians who had just landed in Scotland en route to France to help the Allies. Not true was the view that every man who spoke a foreign language had to be a spy, and therefore shot. That there was a plan to kidnap Clementine Churchill, fly her to Germany, and force her husband, the First Lord, to hand over several dreadnoughts for her release. Well, actually, that part was true. Four men were caught with carrier pigeons arranging the abduction. Luckily for the lady, the panic within Britain was such that these men were seen as suspicious simply because they had bulges in their coats. But Cat was unfazed. She wrote to her busy husband, quote, If I am kidnapped, I beg of you not to sacrifice the smallest or cheapest submarine, or even the oldest ship. I could not face the subsequent unpopularity, whereas I should be quite a heroine and you a Spartan if I died bravely and unransomed, unquote. Churchill himself was guilty of 
heightened senses during the first few weeks of war. As he was driving up to the Lock U anchorage of the Grand Fleet, he spotted a large light on the roof of a private house. When he arrived, and Jellico told him of a plane seen flying nearby, that was it for the First Lord. Gun in hand, he took some men to the private house, which, turned out, belonged to a retired Tory MP, Sir Arthur Bignold, who told Churchill that he had the light attached to the top of his house to catch the reflection from the eyes of deer tearing up his yard, and each morning he would go out and hunt them, now knowing their location. Winston, in his current state, did not believe this rather curious tale, and had the light removed and taken away. However, it turns out that the story was true, but it shows that side of Winston, who looked for danger. One can only imagine that any other minister would have had subordinates sent around to investigate, not Winston. At age 39, he was still willing to stick himself into the thick of it, as we will see. Besides his penchant for danger, other ministers and underlings had to get accustomed to Winston's schedule that would become famous during the next war. He would work until 2 a.m. and then rise at 8 a.m., but not getting out of bed. There he stayed, worked on correspondence, papers all around him, his stenographer seated at the foot of his bed, and, my favorite part, a giant Corona Corona clenched between his teeth. Then he would nap for a bit, and only then rise from bed and officially start his day. As we ended with last time, Winston was having fun, but the enormous burden was felt keenly. Simply, he believed he was up to the task, and the tasks of anyone who wanted to wriggle out of their responsibilities. Soon Churchill was in his own universe, and really his own universe, with at least 20 planets, or in this case, major admiralty projects revolving around him simultaneously. Of course, one of the largest duties was to protect the 70,000 British Expeditionary Force soldiers under Field Marshal Sir John French. And they were certainly safe from the sea. British warships patrolled from Scotland and Norway. Mines had been released on both sides of the Straits of Dover. No, danger to these men could only come from the south. And Winston, like Napoleon, believed in luck. And some came his way in the form of a dead German signalman who was washed up on the beaches of Blighty, who had on his person a cipher book. Soon the Admiralty was tracking German ship movements more accurately than before. But as vast as the ocean is, it simply wasn't enough to satisfy Churchill. He soon had land and air forces under his command. His seaplanes hunted for German U-boats. His former flight instructors, now under his command, had established an air base at Dunkirk on August 27th. The air defense of Britain also came under his command, as he was asked to take this over by the new Minister of War, Kitchener. He had been promoted effective August 5th. K of K, as he was called, and Winston would become close in a very short period of time. So, as Winston was worrying over the water around Britain, the British beaches it lapped upon, the air above it, and now parts of the continent, only Clementine was worried about him. One of her letters read, in response to one of his, saying how tired he was, quote, 1. Never missing your morning ride. 2. Going to bed well before midnight and sleeping well, and not allowing yourself to be woken up every time a Belgian kills a German. 3. Not smoking too much and not having indigestion. Now, shall I come up for a day or two next Monday and tease you partly into doing these things? Unquote. Clearly she was worried, but more than that, as an intelligent, loyal person of the British Empire, she, like everyone else, was dying to know what was going on. And Winston was dying to please his love. So he sent her sensitive information by post, but urged her to burn it the moment it was read. And she complied. But one thing he could not tell her was of the BEF. If Germany found out about that, they would change their plans, and the Allies believed 
they had a nasty welcome party waiting for the invaders. So Winston felt he could divulge information about naval battles, certainly after they were over. But for now, the problem was, most of the news was bad. The Gobin and the Breslau had slipped away from British ships and made their way through the Dardanelles. Then the Kaiser announced his selling of those two craft to Turkey to make up for what Winston had done to them earlier. Soon these two ships, though they were still crewed by Germans, led other Turkish ships to bombard Odessa and other Russian ports. In response, Russia declared war on Turkey, which meant Britain and France had to follow suit. The war continued its ebb and flow. The British, under Beatty, moved into German home waters, sunk three cruisers, and damaged three more. And Winston crowed. But it was too soon for that. This was not the end, but only the beginning. The Germans wisely went underwater and went on the offensive with their U-boats. The results were disastrous for Britain. Three British cruisers were sunk off the Dutch coast. Then German U-boats navigated into Loch U and sank the Hawk. Then the dreadnought Audacious. This was followed up by the sinking of the Formidable. Clearly, Scapa Flow was unsafe. Churchill had the remaining ships set sail for open waters so the defenses of North could be improved. But honestly, Winston should have seen what was coming next. As the East Coast was more or less undefended, three German battlecruisers approached, bombed Hartlepool, Whitby, and Scarborough, and made their escape without a single shot being fired at them. British freighters were sunk at alarming rates in the Pacific. The cruiser Edmund attacked the port at Madras in the Bay of Bengal. And near Ceylon, many other merchantmen were lost to German naval power. Of course, momentum would change. It always does in war. Many of those ravaging German warships would eventually be on the bottom of the ocean, their crews as well. But as for the outbreak of the war, the Royal Navy's losses stunned the country. The British people, deservedly proud of their senior military branch, could not comprehend the losses to the Germans, and most turned their gaze and blame to Winston. Suddenly, his profile, which stood out most of Asquith's ministers, was now a liability. The people, papers, and MPs were lined up against him. What's the Navy doing, heckled civilians in the street and in the house. Winston, of course, could not answer that question. Missions had to be kept secret until they were over, and perhaps even beyond that point. But an answer was wanted. As William Manchester wrote, quote, it was scapegoating time again, unquote. And in some ways, the target, or victim, had already been chosen. Prince Louis, the first sea lord, may have been an able officer, but that did not change the fact that he was an able German officer. And soon, Louis Alexander of Badenburg was removed. Winston, taking part in this sham, wrote to the king, quote, The exacting duties and heavy responsibilities of his office have no doubt affected his general health and nerves, so that for the good of the service, a change has become necessary, unquote. But the sailor king felt the remorse that others weren't sure it was prudent to show. Louis then took the king's suggestion to change his last name to Mountbatten. Dickie Mountbatten, Prince Louis's surviving son, would restore the family's honor in time. Now a replacement was needed, someone who could lift up the people's courage, their belief in the Royal Navy. For Winston, that was Lord Fisher. But the man, though impressive for his age, was now 74. Still, Asquith gave his consent. Elated, Winston then moved to the next barrier, the king. But Violet Asquith, who seemed to be everywhere, or at least where it mattered, told Winston, in reverence to Fisher, quote, No one knows his weather better than you do, and you are no doubt prepared for squalls ahead, unquote. To Winston replied, quote, I know him, and I know that I can manage him, unquote. Problem was, Fisher felt the same way about the younger First Lord. When Winston was summoned to Buckingham Palace, King George had to admit to his great surprise at the suggestion of Fisher. 
He listed his royal grievances against the elder seamen and ended with, he wanted to know what Asquith thought. The Prime Minister would reply with some very unpleasant remarks about Fisher's appearance, but in the end said he supported the decision. The King had done all he could. The appointment was signed, and Fisher was brought into the King's presence. But, having been coached by Winston, the new First Sea Lord impressed the Sovereign with his energy and enthusiasm. Churchill and Fisher got on well at first. But really, both had enormous egos and wanted to run the show. At the beginning, at least, their fervor was satisfied by directing action towards their German enemy. After Winston let Fisher in on a little secret, the new First Sea Lord wrote to a friend, quote, The king said to Winston, I suppose dissuading, that the job would kill me. Winston was perfectly lovely in his instant reply. Sir, I cannot imagine a more glorious death. Wasn't that delicious? Unquote. But King George V had been right in his concern of Fisher. The mad genius who had brought the Royal Navy into the modern age, while ruffling, if not right out ripping, feathers along the way, was losing his own war with time. Fisher brought to his superior a plan to force their way into the Baltic Sea, cut Germany from its Scandinavian supplies, and lay the groundwork for a Russian invasion of Berlin. Winston loved its grandiose goals and scope, but when Churchill brought up questions, finding a few flaws with the plan, Fisher was vague or evasive. Also, as abrasive as he was on paper, the Admiral was extremely conservative in action. To Winston, it seemed that Fisher did not want to take any action that might lose him ships. Because, to him, their job was to keep open lines of communication, cut off the enemy's ability to communicate or resupply, all the while letting the army win the war and suffer the consequences of fighting. But Churchill firmly believed that, quote, it is not right to condemn operations of war simply because they involve risk and uncertainty, unquote. But what was certain was that Winston was trapped with the aging Fisher, and it was within a cage of his own making. The problem was, for Fisher's reasoning and for everyone else in general, that the current mode of thinking in terms of warfare was at loggerheads with current weaponry. General Ferdinand Foch said, when the French were making their war plans, their latest plan, 17, finished in 1906, quote, there is only one way to defend ourselves, to attack as soon as we are ready, unquote. French field regulations started off with the following, quote, the French army henceforth admits no law but the offensive. The offensive alone leads to positive results, unquote. As for the Germans, the aggressors in the war, their role demanded that they take the offensive. Their plan, the Schlieflin plan, which correctly guessed the French plan number 17, called for luring the French to the German left at Lorraine and then to advance on the German right with a million men. The Ark would swing wide, brush the coast, having gone through Belgium and come up behind the advancing French offensive and on Paris, but the French advance would be trapped a short, successful war. The French believed the same of their plan, a direct push into the heart of Germany, forcing them to fall back to protect Berlin. But the problem was, again, modern weaponry. The impressive artillery and machine guns were not mounted on protective wheeled platforms, ready to move forward. These items were meant to be lined up and fired while stationary. So the men themselves would have to move forward. Their stationary weapons would assist them all they could, but nothing would be stopping enemy artillery and machine gun platforms from firing directly into the surging men. It was a recipe for a human tragedy that would be played over and over for years. But it would be unwise to start a World War I podcast in the middle of a Churchill podcast, when it's supposed to be a World War II podcast. The gist of all this was that the British would lose 15,000 soldiers, dead or wounded, in only five days. And that was nothing compared to French losses. In time, the BEF would be pushed back, along with the French, 
157 miles, and find themselves just outside Paris. Soon word got back to British reporters who put out what they knew about casualties. Kitchener was devastated and couldn't hide it. But Winston's Tory friend, F. E. Smith, believed young British men would respond to the tragedy by signing up to help their troubled brothers in arms. He was right, but it was just more meat for the grinder. The Schlieflin plan had almost worked, until it didn't. Still, the Germans had swung wide right, come down on the French, but then were stalemated. Instead of moving forward, both sides then moved sideways and dug trenches. In time, there would be a race to the coast that no one would win. But for now, the Germans controlled northern France, though the Belgians were still in the fight. France's Plan 17 was equally ruined. It was now a time of improvisation, or simply just beating one's head against the enemy's bulwark. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Lloyd, host of Historical Blindness, the podcast about historical mysteries, myths, and frauds. With so many working from home these days, we become our own taskmasters, making ourselves feel guilty about taking any time to have a bit of fun when we think we should be doing something productive. The truth is that self-care increases productivity, and taking a little break here and there to enjoy yourself can make you more focused when you return to the tasks you've set yourself. Good thing the puzzle adventure game Best Fiends is always within reach, so that you can reward yourself with some hard-earned fun. I find time to play between tasks as a palate cleanser when I need to shift gears. I'm only on level 143, but there's always so much new content, new characters, and new seasonal events. There's an endless supply of fun to inject into my day. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. The brave stance of Belgium was shocking to the Germans, glorious to the Allies, but was also doomed. Numbers, after all, do tell. So when Liege fell, Namur, to its west, was defenseless. Seeing this, on August 18th, King Albert had his five divisions pull back from Brussels and the River Get and reposition themselves at the port of Antwerp. General Kluck was forced to inform the Kaiser that the Belgians had, quote, managed to escape our grasp, unquote, which forced him to leave 50,000 men there who may have made a difference at the Marne. Those 60,000 German troops were to invest Antwerp. Zeppelins were sent over to bomb the port city, but the damage there was negligible. That was about to change. Kaiser Wilhelm wanted the gateway to the sea and would have it at any cost. His words. So, during the final week of September, 420 millimeter Krupp howitzers were hitting Antwerp's outer siege works with 2,000 pound shells. And, as there was no way to defend against this, it was assumed Antwerp would fall. But how important was it to deny the Germans this access point to the sea? Fisher, a few years ago, said it was imperative, but now the British cabinet wasn't so sure, or rather didn't know if it was important or not. As for Winston, he had not quite yet made that leap of wisdom, but knew enough to hold it if his enemy, the Kaiser, wanted it. So Antwerp would be fortified and reinforced, but how to get the men and material there in a timely fashion? To get to the port city, ships must go along the shelled river, and that, or at least an important part of it, belonged to the Netherlands, and as they were busy being extremely neutral at the moment, would not allow military forces to go through. This left the Allies with a land corridor to cross, of some 50 miles, not exactly perfect for speed. In time, Winston would see that the line of port cities was really a chain, and if one was taken by the Germans, then the rest would follow with time and constant pressure. The best course was to make sure that the first one wasn't lost. General Joffre was in the same boat as Winston, and so asked for British troops to land at Dunkirk and let their presence be known, 
Perhaps the Germans would stay away from Dunkirk then. Winston had already taken his flyers over there to station them, and was sent over again on September 9th to make room for more troops. But he kept this from the cabinet, as they were currently hissing at him for naval losses. His peers would not take kindly to him gallivanting around northern Europe while British ships and lives were being lost. But, it has to be said, nothing much came of this latest show of Churchillian zeal for war. General Kluck didn't even know the detachment of Marines and the Oxfordshire Hussars were on the continent. But the experience certainly made an impression on Winston. He found the whole thing exciting. Within a week, he was back in France, going between Calais and the British General Headquarters. Four days later, he had returned to Dunkirk, experiencing an air raid. By now, the cabinet had picked up on Winston's adventures, and memories of the Sydney Street criminals who burned to death under Churchill's decision, the former Tory lord who had his searchlight dismantled, were coming back to paint Churchill in the light of a thrill-seeker. Not as a serious man with a serious job of getting on with the war and saving British lives. But the traveling had finally helped Winston see the light about the importance of Antwerp. So he set about trying to convince Kitchener, who was rather more cool on the subject. But what brought the war minister over was the fact that, as the Germans were retreating from the Marne to the Enne River, if Antwerp was given up, those two German corps could then begin a domino effect as they attacked one port city after another. In time, Dunkirk, Calais, and Boulogne would be in German hands. No, those German forces in Belgium had to be tied down. This revelation and Winston's constant messages brought Kitchener round by September 29th. He, therefore, jumped into action by scrounging around for material. Now, just the men were needed. The French were approached and responded with the promise of contributing a division, some fifteen to 20,000 men, and offered to put it under British command. The cabinet met this commitment with promising their 7th division that was about to join Field Marshal French. However, all of this seemed too little too late. On August 2nd, Asquith wrote to a young lady he fancied that the situation was desperate. The Germans had already managed to take out two forts, get in between some of the defenders, and push others away from their lines. That was it for the Belgian government. They proclaimed their intention to evacuate and make for Austin, with their documents and treasure. But then the British ambassador to Belgium, Sir Francis Villiers, found out about this decision and returned to London. He laid out the news to Kitchener and Foreign Secretary Gray. Antwerp would fall, the Germans would have access to the Channel, and an invasion of Britain could be the result. Kitchener, who had this particular fear even before the situation deteriorated, desired to take action. But as the Prime Minister was out of town, giving yet another recruitment speech, the ranking officer and foreign minister were unable, without another cabinet minister, to take action. They contacted Churchill. He listened to their story, agreed that reinforcements had to be sent over forthwith. He then recommended the Admiralty's Marine Brigade, and then, being Churchill, offered to go over himself and assess the situation. The two men, relieved, agreed with everything. Winston crossed over and met with the Belgian cabinet. Soon after, a message went out from that body to all Belgian troops. They were to hold fast. Churchill was driven to Antwerp's Hotel de Ville. The car pulled up, decelerating from its great speed. A cloud of smoke enveloped the car and the man as he exited from the vehicle. One observer later wrote, It was a scene, quote, in a melodrama where the hero dashes up bareheaded on a foam-flecked horse and saves the heroine or the old homestead or the family fortune, as the case may be, unquote. Winston then spoke to King Albert and Premier de Brokeville and said behind him were 2,000 veteran Marines. And also, soon to be en route, were his two naval brigades, two million rounds of ammunition and five days' ration. 
the two leading Belgians were moved beyond words. That Sunday, the day the government was supposed to have left, Winston toured the defenses, being driven around in a Rolls Royce. His naval driver recorded his impression from that day. Quote, Mr. Churchill was energetic and imperative. He discussed the situation with his own staff and some of the Belgian officers, emphasizing his points with his walking stick. His actions were emphatic. He appeared on occasion to criticize the siding and construction of the trenches. Mr. Churchill dominated the proceedings and the impression formed that he was by no means satisfied with the position generally. He put forward his ideas forcefully, waving his stick and thumping the ground with it. Unquote. Soon there was another thumping of the ground. The Marines had landed and were marching to Winston. The terrified civilians were now ecstatic. Churchill also got word that the cabinet had released the two naval brigades to him, as he was not allowed to decide this on his own. But this was a mistake. Yes, they could be sent out quickly, which was needed, but they were completely untrained and ill-equipped. Most had never fired a gun or dug a trench. Not that it mattered. Most had no ammunition, nor carried trench tools. But they were dashing in their uniforms. One of those new recruits marching along was Asquith's son, Ock. He and the others around him may not have known what to expect, but there was no way they could predict the cold, the fear, the gut-wrenching artillery blasts overhead they experienced that night. They woke at 2 a.m., marched to the trenches, and relieved the exhausted Belgians. While this was going on, Churchill, totally in the moment, literally took over the defense of the port city. He could be seen running around, looking for weapons, but more importantly, ammunition, arranging men, sighting guns, and in between all this, urging the Admiralty for every conceivable thing needed to defend his trench works. But this latest Churchill operation had not reached its climax just yet. That Monday morning, Asquith got a message from Winston, probably having the time of his life, that read, quote, If it is thought by HM government that I can be of service here, I am willing to resign my office and undertake command of relieving and defensive forces assigned to Antwerp in conjunction with Belgian army, provided that I am giving necessary military rank and authority and full powers of a commander of a detached force in the field, unquote. The Prime Minister was speechless, except when he read the telegram to the Cabinet. When the words sank in, they laughed. Their inflection was not complimentary. However, Kitchener, who used to hate Winston, quietly sat through their laughter. He thought it was a good idea and was prepared to commission Winston a lieutenant general. A vote was not necessary. Asquith wrote back, and the answer was no. The command would go to General Rawlingson, who was now at Dunkirk. Problem was, he was unable to make his way forward. Winston found out about this and wrote to Kitchener, quote, In view of the situation and the developing German attack, it is my duty to remain here and continue my direction of affairs, unless relieved by some person of consequence, unquote. That afternoon of Monday, the Marines pushed back a German surge. That evening, Winston went among them, congratulating the now tired and dirty men. He told Kitchener they were cheerful. But one has to wonder if Winston, happy in his element as leader, wasn't projecting his emotions onto those in the dirt. But they were certainly holding up. Earlier in the day, as the Marines made themselves into a stiff wall, a Gio Calza Bedolo, war correspondent for the Giornale d'Italia, was at Lear, southeast of Antwerp. He caught sight of Winston during the clash of men and artillery. Quote, he was still young and was enveloped in a cloak, and on his head wore a yachtsman cap. He was tranquility, smoking a large cigar, and looking at the progress of the battle under a rain of shrapnel, which I can only call fearful. It was Mr. Churchill, who had come to view the situation himself. He smiled and looked quite satisfied. Unquote. The Belgian soldiers and Royal Marines had done good work that day. 
but were now exhausted. The only reserves Winston had were the green 6,000 men of the naval brigades, and he knew better than to put them into the line. So he kept them back and hoped the veterans would be allowed to rest. But they did more than that. Perhaps catching some of the vigor emanating from Winston, the Belgians actually went on the offensive Tuesday morning of October the 6th. They were beaten back, of course. They had the same problem any offensive force had during this time of warfare. But they were showing their mettle. The Belgians filed back into the trench works. The overall situation was still shaky. But word had reached Winston that Rawlingson would soon be there. In fact, the new commander arrived at five that afternoon, but alone. His 40,000 men were still on the water. The recently jubilant Belgians gave into despair on seeing the lone British officer. Antwerp would be evacuated. Winston agreed that his forces would hold the line, giving the Belgians as much time as they could before following hard upon their rear. When Churchill reached Dover late Tuesday night, he discovered many things. First of all, his men, including the inexperienced naval troops, were fighting in the front line, trying to hold back the Germans as the Belgians retreated. Rawlinson had retraced his steps and set up his headquarters at Bruges, closer to the coast. And lastly, that Clementine had given birth to a daughter named Sarah. Churchill rested as much as his tortured mind and soul would let him, and then reported to the cabinet Thursday morning. Asquith thought him brave and remarked that Winston was certainly, quote, one of the people one would choose to go tiger hunting with, unquote. But in this case, the German tiger got close enough to pounce. At the last moment, the French decided not to send those promised troops. The Marine Brigade commander decided, based on this news, to leave the trenches. That Saturday, the Belgians surrendered, while the British troops recrossed the land bridge, making their way to the coast. This report, when it was told to Winston, shattered him. But this wound to his soul was only a precursor to what was coming to his pride. The Morning Post wrote that Antwerp was, quote, a costly blunder for which Mr. W. Churchill must be held responsible. We suggest to Mr. Churchill's colleagues that they should quite firmly and definitely tell the First Lord that on no account are the military and naval operations to be conducted or directed by him, unquote. The Times and the Daily Mail went one step further for their readers. They reprinted the Post's article, and then gave their own slamming to the Antwerp fiasco. Other men, men that mattered, whispered to each other that Winston was clearly unbalanced, maybe like his father, and no one came to his defense, not even Churchill himself. But there was a reason for this. As the military branches were dealing with the repercussions of Antwerp, Churchill could not make any public statements. That would only help the enemy. Besides, no one would have believed the truth anyway. They simply weren't in the mood to. The truth went something like this. Yes, Winston should not have brought the two inexperienced naval brigades, but he shouldn't have been allowed to by the cabinet. And besides, he had the permission of Asquith all along. Churchill was unable to stop the French from not sending their forces into the fray, nor making the Netherlands agree to let the Allies navigate their river. As much as he stood out like a peacock, he was still only one man. But there was another component to the truth that was not well known, and for many, this would be the case for years to come. Asquith realized it before too long, but had to get over his son being put in a dangerous situation before his objectivity returned. Then he wrote that Churchill had delayed the fall of the port city by at least a week, that his actions, quote, prevented the Germans from linking up their forces, unquote. Later, the British official history of the war agreed, quote, the British effort to save Antwerp had failed, unquote, but, quote, until Antwerp had fallen, the troops of the investing force were not able to move forward on Ypres and the coast, that they were too late to secure Newport 
and Dunkirk and turn the northern flank of the Allies, as was intended. Unquote. King Albert of Belgium added on to this sentiment in March 1918. Quote, you are wrong in considering the Royal Naval Division expedition as a forlorn hope. In my opinion, it rendered great service to us, and those who deprecate it simply do not understand the history of the war in its early days. Only one man of all your people had the prevision of what the loss of Antwerp would entail, and that was Mr. Churchill. Unquote. The king closed with this unassailable point. The delay, quote, allowed the French and British armies to move northwest. Otherwise, our whole army might have been captured and the northern French ports secured by the enemy, unquote. But again, this was unknown to the vast majority of Europe at the time. Churchill, it seemed, may be troubled in the head like his father before him, but now he had a reputation for wild, dangerous schemes, having his thumb into too many pies, many of which didn't belong to him in the first place. For now, Winston had to take it, to make do with his stock sinking to a new low. Of course, he did walk away with one piece of wisdom. Quote, Those who are charged with the direction of supreme affairs must sit on the mountaintops of control. They must never descend into the valleys of direct physical or personal action. Unquote. Of course, this wisdom wasn't taken to heart by the First Lord. Not yet. Winston was still too young for that. If anything, his appetite had been whetted, and he lusted for more. More combat, more challenges, more covering up his cowardice by heading into the fray. More glory. Besides, it surely couldn't get any worse. But if that was his thinking, then he thought wrong. I love that sound. The sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. What are you waiting for? Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale, reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash worldwar2, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash world war two right now. Shopify.com slash world war two. Greetings, everyone from Central Virginia. So um, I just wanted to take a couple of moments and bring you up on the tour because there have been some major changes. And um, I think you'll agree once you hear all these that you're going to consider them improvements and be just as excited as I am. So the first thing I wanted to tell you was we have a new partner at the History of World War II podcast. We are partnering up with Geek Nation Tours, and with us today is the man himself, the head geek, Terrace Cassidy. So Terrace, thank you very much for being with us today. Yeah, my pro my pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so so we've talked a couple times. Uh, Paul Finch got us together, and we've really worked things out. And I'm just really excited about this. So what uh, Terrace and I are going to do, even though the details are still being worked out, obviously, um, we're just going to tell you what we do know, and then go from there, and just give you all the information that we have so far. So first of all, um, I'm excited about this. Terrace uh, is going to go with us when we go on the tour. He goes on all his tours and he really gets involved with it. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun. So you'll have two guides for the price of one. Um, and so I think I've already challenged him already to read up on World War II. So for, for the entire tour, we can try to out um, trivia each other the entire time we're going around to see the sites. So are you up for that? 
Yeah, by all means. I I, uh, I believe that you may win it. Are we going to play for beers, or what are, what are we going to play for? Well, I have a very low tolerance, so if we do, you'll probably win in the end, but I'll start out <laughs> strong. But that, that's fine. That's, <laughs> that's fine. Great. Okay, That's cool. Perfect. Now, I, I think I think it's really great that you go and that you try to make it a very personal, very emotional experience for the person, so they can really be submerged uh, into the uh, to the subject or the tour. That was one of the things that drew me to you, and I, w- I was just really impressed by that. Thank you. Yeah, that's what we really try to. Uh, as a matter of fact, this last summer we came back from our, our Gettysburg uh, trip. Of course, this was the 150th anniversary of that battle, and right. it was it was a tremendous. We went to Antietam, Manassas, and uh, Gettysburg, and and as you know, that's it can be a very emotional place. And and I'll try to make sure that everybody gets a real a lot of details, facts, and figures about the whole thing, and and maybe a, a few different perspectives on 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 the battlefield that we're visiting, and of course. Uh, an emotional tie because it's it's hard not to do that actually when we're talking about such a, a, a great and interesting subject. Yeah, I have a lot of listeners. Um, I have some some rather young listeners who are uh, in some ways being introduced to the subject of the war. But then there's a lot of people my age who have read a lot of little books. Uh, re- excuse me, read a lot of books, but they're wanting to get into the um, minutia, if you will, the detail. And, and certainly that's something we'll try to bring uh, with us on the tour. And I think they'll appreciate that very much. Well, by all means, I think that we'll try to to bring a few things home that that uh, uh, other tours won't 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 get. You know, I mean, uh, we'll yeah. see some really cool detail places uh, when we're in London for sure. Okay. Now, the, the next thing that we do know is um, we're we're going next year, next September. Um, originally, I was telling everyone with the other company um, it was going to be October first, so I was able to get um, Terrace to give us what I think we went for what mid or late September. Yeah, I think we're going to try. We're trying to leave uh, the eighth and uh, ha- be, have have it done by the eighteenth, somewhere around there. Okay. Uh, I'm not. We're not sure exactly how long we're going to do it for yet, because uh, the tour is just being built. But uh, consider it probably between seven and and, and ten days. Uh, I do have to be done because I'm headed off to our uh, miniatures in in uh, the UK tour Scotland. So uh, right after this one, so okay. so it'll be back to back for me. Cool. So for those of you who wanted to go, who were looking at October 1st, if you could manage um, that time in September, I think everything will, will work out just fine. The other thing I wanted to share with everybody is, and this was very important to me, and Terrace was really gracious in doing this, is that we still are going to have a discount for the members of the History of World War II podcast. So, again, the details are are being worked out, but we'll certainly take care of you because that's what's fair. And I just want to give you as much value for your dollar as I possibly can. By all means, I mean that's that's great for everybody. Everybody wins that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's good for you guys to to have uh, the the elite members of of, of your podcast uh, and listeners, and uh, we're, we we want to make sure everybody's happy in in that capacity too. Excellent. And now here's one of the bigger changes, and this is the part that I'm really excited about, which is why I kind of moved uh, towards your company. Instead of doing like a, a very large tour where we're jumping to different countries, and quite frankly, half the tour is, is taking place uh, before I've gotten to it in the main storyline, we're going to give you more of a thematic tour. We're really going to focus it in. And what I was talking to Terrace about is what would be really neat is if we could take almost like a snapshot of the time during World War II when the Br- British are alone. Uh, France has just f- um, fallen out of the war. Uh, there's no fighting really yet in North Africa. The Greeks haven't started roughing up the uh, Italians. It's just like a, there's a moment in time that we want to freeze where the British were facing the uh, might of the uh, the Third Reich on their own. And uh, so we want to cover as many different sites to show you that and to, and to try to give you a sense of what it felt like for those people in that very uh, frightful time. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's what that'll be. That'll be the central theme now. I think that mm-hmm. Britain alone is going to be the the central theme of the, of the tour itself. Yeah. I think that that really gives us a lot to look for in the future too. What else we can do with with uh, other tours that we might uh, end up in the future? But th- that's great that we have a theme, and I I will definitely try to keep keep that theme and uh, make sure everybody has more detail. And that, that, that's that's what we've always wanted to go through with uh, our company and and. And we're happy to do that again. 
Excellent. And, and the one thing that I was able to ask Terrace about, and he said yes, was that we're definitely going to go to Churchill's birthplace because I'm in the middle of this very long um, side show of, of a biography of him. And so just to include that and to go see the palace that he was born in, I'm just really looking forward to that and, and the grounds and stuff like that. I've heard wonderful things about it. So whatever we do as far as the Battle of Britain, Bletchley Park, we'll certainly be adding lemon and we're just going to have a lot of fun with this. Yeah, that's exactly it. We've got lots of places to stop and tons of uh, things of interest that everybody's going to really love. So uh, we're really, really looking forward to the whole thing for sure. Excellent. Oh, and one more thing I wanted to say, um, then I'm going to turn things over to Terrace. Uh, as we were talking through this and we were going to really focus the tour and, and um, really narrow it down to give people experience, one of the other benefits of that is that I think um, the, the price is going to come down significantly. So this is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be very emotional. We're going to connect with the events. But at the same time, it's going to be a lot more affordable. Again, we don't have that worked out yet, but I can promise you, based on what was going to happen before, that this is going to be um, – significantly um, reduced in, in price and again i'm just excited because that means more people can go and just share the experience and that's what it comes down to just to be able to do that and to um, to meet as many listeners as i possibly can but now that's just me focused on this one tour terrace <clears throat> excuse me terrace with his experience has got a lot a uh, lot bigger ideas than i do and i just wanted him to share some of those with you when you came to me, we were really excited about it because we had been thinking about doing a World War II uh, tour for some time. Oh, okay. As you as you know, we we do uh, battlefield tours al- already. Uh, we we for instance uh, did Gettysburg, like I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're doing Japan uh, next year, 2014, and then uh, Waterloo thereafter, and, and followed by uh, Little Bighorn. So we we go all the, over the world, and uh, my. Co- Clients come from all over the world too that are very interested in in various battlefields that that, that we take part in. World War II has been kind of uh, on, on the books, but but we haven't had really a, a means to do it, and and you our partnership definitely creates that. So what we would what we want to do though is we don't want since World War II is such a huge war and one battlefield, and I think one trip just wouldn't really cover it i think what we should try to do is is try to go from front to front so you might in the future see us doing uh the eastern eastern front uh, stalingrad uh, uh, that kind of stuff and uh, maybe the pacific germany of course we're going to go visit uh, france and italy uh that kind of thing so even africa is is up for up for, up for grabs and even hawaii we might be able to be able to bring our our wives uh, to that one right that we would be amazing both, you know so there's there's lots that we can do and we're going to probably do a tour every second year so this is not just the a one off tour i think it's going to be a really grand tour and we're going to make sure that we cover all the fronts eventually and i think that we'll we'll be very detailed in each front and uh, you'll be able to travel the world with uh, a World War II podcast and 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 uh, Geek Nation tours. So that's really the, the the goal, anyway, for sure, is to to do this more than once. That is that is exciting. I'm very uh, excited about this. Um, so for all of, all of you who have emailed me, your um, inf- you wanted information about the tour, or you sent an email to the other uh, email address I told you, um, that's pretty much been um, just shut down. Don't worry about that. If you could send one to uh, Terrace at Geek. Nation Tours. Um, so could you give them the website and the email address they should use? Sure. Uh, you can find us at uh, geeknationtours.com, of course. So geek, G-E-E-K, nationtours.com. And uh, the email you want to send to is headgeek at geeknationtours.com. So that's a little bit of an ego. No, I'm just joking. Yeah, okay. that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I put myself above everybody else. No, when, that, that's <laughs> why when you said that you were going to go on the tour uh, with us, one, I was excited about that. But then I, you know, do I have to share my celebrity? I don't know how comfortable I am with that, but we'll see how it goes. No, I'll just, I'll point, I'm just the guy that will manipulate everybody into following you anyway. So that, That's perfect. Okay, no. I'm, I'm, I'm there to make you look good. Oh, well, I need more people like that. Okay, good. So, <laughs> so um, again, I'm glad we found each other. I think this is going to be great. It's going to be a success. And we have another wager. We, we talked a lot uh, the other day. We have another wager going on about who's going to sign up uh, more people. Is it going to be History of World War II podcast people, or is it going to be um, people who've been on um, – trips with you and and know what you provide or i've heard good things and so that'll be just another wager bet uh competition that will uh there's gonna be a lot of testosterone uh on this but but i think 
think it's going to be a lot of fun. And again, yeah. for, for anybody who can, just send uh, Terrace an email, and he'll, as soon as we know stuff, he'll put it on his website. Everything's going to be handled on his website. I think the most I'll do is maybe just make a link from mine to to that page of yours or something like that, and we'll just let you handle it all and, and take care of everyone like I know you will. Yep, by all means. As, as a matter of fact, I, I, there's there's not much details. We have an upcoming uh, tours section to our mm-hmm. our site, and uh, it's already posted. Actually, I put oh, wow. it up there already. Uh, there's not. Uh, I usually have some pretty pictures and, and graphics and that kind of thing, and of course the full tour description. You won't see any tour description, and you'll just see our geek smiley on there right now. And uh, basically, that means that the tour is ready for pre-registration. So what that can, can do is you can go and register for it right now. Uh, of course, no money down just to secure your spot. And what I do is as soon as we get the uh, tour description down, as soon as we get the pricing down, I me- email you and then you can decide to go forward or not. So you can kind of pre, pre-grab a spot prior to even worrying about uh, uh, uh paying or anything like that and and just so you know all my tours are very i want to make sure that everybody's very personal on my tour i want everybody to have really a personal relationship with myself and and any guest uh, uh, guides that i have yourself included Mm -hmm. and and to make friends from all around the world because my tours are all about bringing people together that have a common interest right and and so what i do is i really make sure that Everybody has a chance to grab a spot. So we only have 35 spots, however. So right. that's, uh, that's, that's why we try to make it more personal is because we have uh, a lot of tours are 60, 70 people, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And, and I think that's just way too big for this kind of tour. So, yeah. so, that's, the, so that's what we're going to be. So, yes, uh, even now you can go and pre-register. Somebody can pre-register right now. So, so uh, it's, it's waiting for you. And as we move forward, there will be more and more information on that particular site, uh, that particular part of my site and uh, pictures of where we're going and and what we're doing and and a full description and if you want to see what it's going to look like just hit my waterloo trip or my uh my um japan trip and you'll kind of get a more a better feel of what that tour description will actually look like uh, within the next uh, couple months I i hope to have have it priced and and completed by the end of january i'm uh we were hoping to get it done by December, mm-hmm. but of course the Christmas season is coming. So whether or not that is going to be possible, or right? Not. So. Well, if you just give up sleep, I don't see why. No, I'm yeah, that's no. Right. well, I'm I'm easy. I I can do that. It's just that everybody else <laughs> won't do that. See, ah, that's gotcha. the problem. Gotcha. You're, 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 I understand. <laughs> there was something you you made, you made me think of something. There's a very famous. I can't remember if it's a photo or a cartoon. It's a it's a man standing on a on London rooftop and he's kind of shaking his fist or staring up at the sky and it says the caption is very well alone. I'll see if I can find that and send that right, to you. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've seen that. You know, I'm sure a lot of people have seen it, but I'll send it to you. I think that would be pretty cool. That would be awesome. Maybe I'll put that. I'll, yeah. I'll put I'll put that up on my on the site. That'll be perfect. Yeah. So so Terrace, thank you very much. I really do appreciate uh, the partnership. I think this is going to be very exciting. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes and and see how many tours we can do. But I would love to go to Russia, to Africa, and to all those other places that uh, that I'm only reading about and you can only see pictures. But that would be just so exciting. So I'm very thankful, and I think this is going to be a lot of fun. It sure is. Uh, I'm very excited too. Thank you for for contacting me, and I'm more than happy to to, to hop on board. Okay. We were going to mention a contest too, though. Oh, we that's not? right. Yes. So, um, thank you. See that you're the professional. I'm just a guy who reads a bunch of books. Okay. So we thought we'd be really neat. We thought it'd be really neat if um, if everybody wanted to. Um, for those of you who are thinking about going, if you can send Terrace an email and you can tell us of a place specifically that you think would be a good place to visit or to see um, on the uh, Battle of Britain or the Britain Alone tour, however we're going to call it. And if we uh, end up using your idea and making that part of the tour, you'll get a free membership from me uh, for a year for the podcast. So send those ideas. I'm sure there's lots of them. Send them to Terrace to his email address. He'll let me know and then I'll, I'll set you up with the membership. So again, just just another way to, to thank people to be a part of this um, this uh, joyous thing that's going to happen next year, and we'll just all have fun with it. Sure, that's awesome. Very good. 
Okay, so so Terrace will give me information. I'll keep informing to the listeners, and once we have everything done, we can get Terrace back on here and and just and just give you the works, and we'll tell you everything we're going to do. So Terrace, thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. Again, thank you. It was a pleasure. All right, take care, everybody, and I'll see you as soon as I can with episode ninety-five. <laughs>